On today's episode, we're super excited to have Laurier offensive line coach Zach Scotto with us to talk us through how he breaks down the pass set for his guys, and he's got some video for us uh, from the 2019 season. Uh, Zach, welcome to the show. Super happy to have you on. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I'm super excited. Obviously, I've known known Coach Yonkers for quite a while now. We've played together. We've coached together. Um, so anytime I can be a part of this, I'm more than happy to. Um, breaking down the, the, you know, the pass set, the anatomy of the pass set, for lack of better terms, um, I do want to start with, if you're, you know, if you're watching this, if you're listening to this, uh, whether you're a coach or a player, everybody's system is a little different. So the pass set has a lot of variables that are predicated based on coaching, predicated based on scheme, um, variables that have to do with where your quarterback's landing spot is. Um, when I'm talking about this, I'm going to be talking about it in generalities um, on just a base drop back. Uh, the ball's not coming out right away. It's not quick. It's not quick game. Um, a, a base drop back. So I'm going to try and talk in generalities that can be applied to multiple schemes, multiple systems um, that can be, you know, they can go, they can go to anybody. Um, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to fit one system. It can, it can go to anyone. Um, the way I look at it, the pass set has four phases, essentially. Um, some of them you have complete control over, some of them you don't. Um, the first one you have absolute complete control over and it typically goes very, very undervalued, very, very underappreciated and very, very underworked, uh, is the stance. Your stance has to be efficient. Your stance has to be powerful. Without it, you're automatically putting yourself in recovery mode. And as big offensive athletes, uh, you don't want to be in recovery mode. You want to control as much as you can control. And the stance is something that nobody else has an effect on other than you. So you have full control over that. A couple things that I like to point out all the time. Um, we do everything out of a two-point stance. Again, um, scheme dependent, coach dependent. Um, it really depends on what you're being coached to do or what your philosophies are. But we do everything out of a two-point but a couple things that do need to stay consistent is your shoulder placement, the bend in your hips, bend in your ankles, bend in your knees, obviously, and then something to do with that outside knee. So to kind of go through that, your shoulders never want to get too far over your toes. You never want to get too far over your knees. And you also don't want them sitting back on top of your hips. You're going to create imbalances in where your weight distribution is. Um, so you want to make sure you're finding that happy medium between your, your knees, your toes, and your hips where your shoulders are placed. Secondly, you want to get all your studs in the ground. So you want your heels in the ground. The more pressure, the more surface area that your foot is covering on the ground, the more force you can deliver through the ground and drive in any direction at any point that you need to, regardless of the play. If you're just pushing off your toe, A, you're going to be really susceptible to turf toe and injury, not a fun feeling. And B, you're only pushing off of a very, very small surface. So you're actually creating less force. Um, you want to, you, we're moving in, you know, big impact, small spaces. You want to have a lot of pressure driving through that ground so you can drive in any direction you need to. And then the last thing is with that outside foot, the kick, or the, the outside foot, outside knee, that kick foot. We, you want to create something called a kickstand on your kick foot or your outside foot where your knee is inside your toes. When your knee starts to flex outside your toes, you're, you're shifting your balance and you're shifting your weight distribution. Having that knee inside your toes allows you to create that kickstand feel that as the rep goes, that that feel needs to be consistent because that's how you're going to take on force or deliver force depending on what happens within the rep. Um, but locking that piece in is what's going to allow you to feel powerful uh, and be efficient because I stole this from the Charles Bentley, but efficiency is speed in the box. The faster you're able to move, the the least amount of wasted movement you're able to have the faster you can actually move because you're being efficient. And when everything happens really, really rapidly in the box, you have to be efficient. So that starts with your stance and being in control of your stance. Um, Coach Yonk, is there anything you want to touch on there? Yeah, you know, I think it's it's a great comment. You see so many guys as they learn the stance itself, you know, it's a, it's a labor to try and figure out how to get your body in that, in that position, whether – you know, it's just because you've never been in, a, in an O-line stance before or you have flexibility issues or, you know, if you're a younger player who's grown four inches in the last six months. Um, I think a lot of people try and kind of skip that because it's uncomfortable and it takes time. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think it's really important that it is the, the first phase you have total control over. 
So making yeah. sure that you know you're not leaving anything on the table there. You're not starting in a in a bad spot to steal another of the Charles Bentley line. You know, if you start wrong, you're not going to finish right. And yeah. uh, you know, we want to make sure because we have total control over that aspect. That you know, it's something that we're working on. Yeah, and, it, and as I said earlier, like it is a complete skill. Um, and you can work on it on a field, you can work on it in the gym, you can work on it sitting in your living room. Um, you know, flexibility, stretching, all those types of things are super important, but the, the skill of actually getting into a stance, like you could throw an episode of whatever it is you want on TV and walk back and forth in your living room. Um, I know when I started really trying to work my stance, that's how I did it. I would walk up to the line of scrimmage, get into the stance, turn around and do it again over and over again while I was watching like friends on TV or something like that. Um, so it is 100% a skill and you have complete control over it. And if you have complete control over it, you're going to be way more efficient coming out of it. Um, which leads me going into, into phase two, um, phase two, I call pre-contact. So this is getting to your angles, getting to your spot, um, kick slide, drive, catch, whatever it is that your coach, your coach is teaching. Um, it's essentially you dictating where you're going to meet the defender. So you're going to drive off that, that backside foot to whatever point on whatever angle that you dictate the contact is going to happen with the defender. So the defender is creating an angle based on their body alignment, based on their hip turn, based on a lot of different things that you have to do the mental geometry to figure out where's the worst possible point that they could go on an absolute straight line to get to the quarterback. At minimum, you want to be a speed bump. So your pre-contact phase, your pre-contact angle needs to dictate that you're getting yourself to that point, that intersection point, the junction point, where you're in a body position to take on contact. Because again, at minimum, you want to be a speed bump. So they're going to run on that straight angle to the quarterback. They have to physically go through you at minimum, if not go around you. Ideally, they never get inside because you don't want to travel past that point. Uh, um, and if you do, you're going to have to adjust and be in recovery mode. So some things to think about while uh, you're coming out of your stance through the pre-contact phase. Um, I got a clip here uh, showing stance. So if we're looking at the screen, we're looking at the left tackle here. Uh, this is Bryce Bell. He's going to his fifth year. Uh, he, he was in East-West. Um, uh, he was chosen for East-West this year before uh, COVID-19 took that away from him, unfortunately. Um, but you can see that, that knee on the inside of his foot. Um, we go palms on the knees, elbows tight. And as he's going to work through this, you're going to see him get to his intersection point based on how 42 straight line to the quarterback would look. Um, and that feel, that understanding is going to take a long time, um, take a lot of reps, take a lot of experience. You're going to have to watch a lot of film to see where your quarterback's drop back points are. Um, and it's going to take time, but you're going to get better at it. Um, you just got to keep working at it. But the main thing is, is they, you always want to make them have to go through you because if you're making them go through you, that means you're getting to your spot and that's something that you can directly coach regardless of athleticism, regardless of strength, right? You can build the biomechanic, the kinesthetic ability in your body to take on the bull rush and it's not going to last a whole game because no defender I've ever seen, very, very rarely I should say, can a defender bull rush the entire game and be effective the entire game. So you want to you want to make them have to go through you. Um, if you see me looking down, it's just because I got a couple notes that I, I want to make sure I hit. Um, again, a, lo a lot of this pre-contact is going to be dependent on your scheme, angle, the pocket, quarterback throwing spot. But speaking in generalities, we want to get to a point where he's got to go through us. So if we're looking at the clips, Bryce has dictated that point that he's going to have to go through him. 42 is going to make a decision. Am I going to go through him? Am I going to go try and go inside of him? Am I going to go around him? Right? But we do a really good job here of driving off our inside foot, creating our space, getting to the intersection point in a body position where we can take on contact. That body position that I'm talking about is our hands are up to defend our, our chest. Our weight isn't overly distributed either side. Um, some coaches teach 60-40, 60, 60 on the inside leg, 40 on the outside leg. Some coaches teach 50-50. really doesn't matter as long as – because every body is different. Um, you need to feel that power of if they go inside, I can hammer it hard inside and they're not going to have a clear path. And I have the ability to take it on straight ahead. And I have the ability to, to get it going if they're going to try and go outside. Again, that's very different between each, each person um, and each coach. But in this position – 
as long as you're not too shifted over the outside leg. If you start shifting over the outside leg, your ability to change direction is severely, severely compromised. Whether he goes outside, inside, it really doesn't matter. Right through you, when that weight shifts over the outside leg, the entire integrity of your base, the entire integrity of your stance that you worked so hard to control at the beginning is totally compromised. It's totally shot. So you want to have maintain that base. If we're looking at our stance rules, right, our hands are in a good spot, but our shoulders are in between our toes and our hips. The outside knee is inside the toes and our studs are in the turf, right? That's how we're able to take on contact when that contact phase is inevitably going to happen. Um, those are the keys that you're looking for in pre-contact. That's another phase that you essentially have full control of because it all happens before any the defender does anything. You're saying, I'm going to get to this spot until a point where a defender makes me have to react. That's when the unpredictability begins to happen. Um, so that's phase one, phase two. Coach Yankas? Yeah, I think it's it's a great visual image to imagine that when you get into that set and you get to the intersection point, so you're driving off that inside leg. Some people say kick slide, drive catch, um, you know, however your coach is teaching it to you. But when you get your body to that intersection point, I think another key point here is how square Bryce's shoulders are to the line of scrimmage. Yeah. Um, and you nailed it with that inside, uh, that outside leg, the knee being inside the foot. I think, you know, when I think of the young athletes that I've worked with, um, a lot of the same guys that you've worked with, and that's something that takes guys a long time coming out of high school to understand. Um, and and I think that that's one small thing that whether you're just starting out as an offensive lineman um, or whether, you know, you've been playing football your whole life and, and you're getting into the senior aspect of high school, even university, that's one thing I think a lot of guys don't get coached up on early, and it winds up being a big thing they got to fix later on. Yeah. Um, so we'll stay with, we'll stay with this clip moving through the other phases. And then at the end, we'll look at some other clips. Um, the next part of the, the next part of the, the past set, as I mentioned, is something that's a little more unpredictable. So this is the contact phase. This is where the defender has initiated contact more often than not, it's going to be the defender that initiates the contact, not you, because if you can stay out of contact as long as possible, you're probably going to win the rep because they're not going to be progressing towards the quarterback they're going to be the ones that initiate contact of some kind, whether it's an initial quick contact to get back off contact, or they're going to try and initiate contact to go through you and then work something off of it. Regardless of how it's done, contact is inevitable. It is going to happen, but you want to be in a position to control what that contact looks like at the initial contact point. In this case, Bryce has set himself up to be in a good position for when that contact phase initially happens. There are a couple of different things that you want to think about. Pad level is important. Uh, hip hinge is important. Knee bend is important. Ankle bend is important. Uh, biomechanic principles within the body. That's stuff that you're going to have to work on a lot over time. Um, foot speed is something that you're going to have to work on over time. But the biggest thing is you need to create space off of contact to give yourself an opportunity to see and feel everything that's happening. When you get too tight into your body, when your hands get pinched in on your body like this, you get T-Rex arms. Um, you don't have the ability to have the forces in your hands, the ability to have the forces in your elbows and your shoulders to feel what's happening and react in a way that is meaningful. Same idea as when I get pinched, my shoulders get pushed back and my shoulders end up over my hips, which is, we said at the beginning, that's something we never want. So we need to be able to time our punches up so that we can find meaningful contact. So that contact phase isn't just about having contact, isn't just about having the defender make contact. It's about who between the offensive player and the defensive player is going to have the most meaningful contact at that contact point. Typically, not always, but typically, whoever has the more meaningful contact at that contact point wins the rep, more often than not. So as an offensive player, your biggest priority once you get to that, so you've controlled your stance, you've controlled your, your pre-contact and your angles and your body position and those things, your biggest responsibility is to win first contact. If you win first contact, they get into recovery mode. If they win first contact, you're in recovery mode. And as we said at the beginning, you don't want to be in recovery mode. You can still win if you get into recovery mode, but who wants to be there? Right. We don't want to be in debt. Essentially, we want to be in a position of power. We want to be, be in the plus. Um, so try to win first contact. The way you do that is by winning contact with your hands, winning contact with your eyes, winning contact with your feet. Never, ever, ever will I say never, ever, ever should you be told this either to try and win contact with your head. 
If you win contact with your head, you won't be winning contact for long because you won't be playing very long. You only get one brain. Protect it. That's why you need to create space in addition to all the things I said before that you want to create space to be able to feel and see. You also want to create space so that your head's not in it. Run game, pass game. You want to create space so your head's not in it. You don't want your forehead banging in. So to do that, coaches teach it a lot of different ways. There are some coaches that teach the double under. There's some coaches that teach straight out punch. Um, I'm kind of a combination of both. In the lead up to contact, I go fingers up because I like the ability to have uh, an unlocked shoulder to be able to, to play hand games if you have to. But then into contact, I like to lock the shoulder in to get the elbow in so that it's essentially only forward and back. We're not getting much up down and we're not getting much side to side. Um, we like to get contact, lock it in. So some teams think palms up to have full lock in. Some teams stay here and play hand games the whole time. Some O-line coaches are somewhere in between. I'm somewhere in between where we get thumbs up approximately, but that's on contact. So we want to get contact lock. I'm also a big fan of independent hands whenever possible. The big reason why is if I go to try and make meaningful contact and say I mistime it. If I miss with both hands, I have nothing else to play. Not only that, if I miss with both hands, with that much force coming out, the likelihood is I'm going to play myself out of my shoulders, is how I call it. So my shoulders will come forward, in which case the defender has an easy swipe, they're gone. With independent hands, the force coming through is much lighter than with both hands. So the likelihood of you playing all the way out of your shoulders is much less. Um, but you're also focused more on thinking a jab than a two-hand knockout. Right, so we want to throw one hand. If they move, if they hit it, they do anything with it. It's an easier replace. Um, plus, then you have you know a delivery hand, a power hand, and a control hand. So that inside hand is typically your control hand because you want the defender to have to go around you. That's the longest path. You want to hit with power hand. Use control hand to just control them in there. Okay, so we'll take a look at the rep here. So you can see Bryce's power hand. He's measuring out his punch. His left hand here is that power hand. We're going to make contact. 42 decides he's going to go inside, so his control then becomes a power hand. But because he wasn't trying to throw both hands at the same time, that inside hand is now available to be used still. If he had tried to throw two hands, 42 is gone on the inside off this move. He's got no chance. All right? So we want to be able to use that time, and I'll show on a clip later on um, at the end of this. If you get contact through you, you have to immediately create space with your feet. You have to get your feet out of there. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll save that for the end, but you got to get your feet out of there. Coach Yonkis? Yeah, I think, you know, the idea of independent hands is something that, you know, I think is a lot more common now. Um, but, you know, we, I mean, even, I even remember in high school, I don't think I was ever told one time, you know, to, that you could punch with one hand as opposed to two. Um, you know, and, and I think that that's something a lot of young guys are so focused on a big punch that we see those elbows come out and yeah. the shoulders come forward. Yeah. Um, and it puts them in such yeah, a bad body position to defend that next move. Now, sometimes we'll watch highlight tapes of good players or players that have, you know, impressive high school tapes and it's all them throwing guys around with that big punch. Um, yeah. but you know, I think when it, when, that doesn't put, uh, you know, when they get to our level, that doesn't play. So, yeah. um, it, I think that's a key thing for good. guys to take away. I agree. So here, I, I had it wrong. It's actually this clip. You can see it here. Bryce gets that inside move. He creates space immediately. His feet get the heck out of there, right? So we're creating space. We're having good body position, right, to create space so that we can still control that defender. The last phase, I wouldn't say it's the most important one, but it's the one that's going to decide whether this play goes on your highlight tape or their highlight tape. It's going to decide on whether it's an overall win of the rep or an overall lose of the rep. Uh, the last phase is the finish. This is the least predictable phase of all four. Um, it's all predicated on what the defender does because the defender at some point is still going to try and make a play. They're, even if you do the first three phases perfectly, they're not just going to quit. As long as the ball is back there and the quarterback still has the ball, they're going to keep playing. So you have to keep playing. They're going to try and work inside of you. They're going to spin around you. Excuse me. They're going to retrace their steps and come back. They're going to try and bull through you. They're going to run the long loop and try and come out on the other side. Whatever it is they do, you have to finish. There's a whole bunch of techniques for a whole bunch of different things. Coaches are going to coach it differently. 
at the end of the day, in speaking in terms of generalities, it comes down to your want and your effort. There's a couple things that, you know, coaches can control. There's some things that players can control. Um, and there's stuff in between, but there's something that you can always control, and that's always your want and your effort. That's what the finish is. Active hands, active feet, play through the echo of the whistle, because you never know when that fraction of an inch, you never know when that extra second and a half of, of protection is going to make the difference from the quarterback getting out and running for a first down, getting the ball out because he's got pressure in his face from another point of the pocket. Um, you never know. You never know. So as long as that whistle hasn't been blown, you have control over your effort. You have control over your want level. You have to finish the rep. So in this case, 42 sees that the ball is about to go by him. He's a little late jumping to it, but he recognizes that he wants to make a play. 42 is trying to make a play. So Bryce tries to make a play off of it. You don't really see it much in the film, but there's a little shot in there where he's trying to get anything he can, right? He's not in the best body position ever. He doesn't have hands on when 42 jumps, but he's trying to make something happen. You can see it very slightly in there that he gets a little push with his hand. The reason why that's important is if you look at 42's left arm, the second he feels that, that push on his kidney, that push on his rib, that push in that vulnerable area, his left arm goes down. That's that's could have been the difference between the ball getting knocked down and the ball getting out if 42 jumps at the right time. That could have been the difference, right? So that's the difference between making a play, not making a play, showing your want, showing your effort. And I guarantee if you're a high school player watching this, if you put those types of things in your highlight film, whether 42 goes to the ground, whether you get a pancake, doesn't really matter. If you put, if you put clips in there that show all out effort, all out want levels, that's what's going to get coaches' attention. Size, speed, skill, all that stuff, super, super important. But if you show an all-out want, an all-out effort level in your highlight film, that's what's going to get coaches' attention. Right? You have to finish every play no matter what. Those are your four phases. Coach, uh, before I get into the film, anything? Yeah, awesome. No, I think we can roll right on to the next couple of clips, and, and we can kind of make comments as we go. Cool. All right, here we're going to look at a couple different – uh, over the next couple clips here we're, we're looking at the we run field and boundaries so we're looking at the field tackle we're looking at bryce again bryce has got two reads on this clip so he's got a couple different rules here but the thing i want you to see is that he's controlling his angles he's got 42 again he's controlling his angles the whole way you see now he's in a right-handed stance he's still controlling a stance right it's the same idea you know knee inside the toes good hip bend good angles all through his body Right, he's gonna get to his angle. He's gonna maintain his angle. Then he gets he goes two hand punch here because he's got body head up, and then we lock it in. Reps over, easy. Then well, we're gonna show on the other end. Then you can see the all out effort to get to it, but we'll show the other cut. So again, you can see that stance, knee inside foot or knee inside big toe, bend in the elbows, bend in the hip, bend in the feet. Right, or bending the ankles, excuse me. We're getting all of our studs in the ground. This one takes a little while. We're getting to our angle. We're driving off that inside foot, getting to our angle. We get punch lock. So if you see the right elbow, you see an initial flare of the elbow, and then we get lock in. Right? And 42 has got nowhere he can go. His left hand, Bryce's left hand, is working as that control hand to keep 42 exactly where he wants him, right? On that outside three – or he wants, he wants to maintain the inside of three quarters of 42 so that 42 is working on the outside of him, right? Because outside is the longest loop to get to the quarterback. Ball gets caught. You'll see this from all my guys. Ball gets caught. They try and make a move. Let's go to the next one. Here we're looking at the left guard because we want to get some inside perspective to this too. So the left guard here is actually working down on a post down. So instead of driving off his inside foot, he's going to be driving off his outside foot because at all times we want to protect the straightest line to the quarterback. The straightest line of the quarterback is through that A gap. So in between the center and the guard here for this uh, boundary defender. So my boundary guard, Braden, has to drive off his outside foot to protect that straight line. So at minimum, 
He's a speed bump. So we drive off that inside outside foot. We get to where we want. We get contact. We ultimately get a little bit of help. But the one we want to focus on here is we get one, two, three, four, five. Ball's caught, and we're all moving. You never know. Ball could pop out. You could be the one to save your season by recovering the fumble. Seen it happen. We had uh, we had an old lineman here actually get a first down this year by recovering a fumble. So. We're worth chasing the ball. You might catch a little glory. So here you, we're driving off that left foot. We're, again, we're looking at the left guard, getting down on his path, a straight line. We're getting contact, and then we're finishing. Right? All five guys move into the ball. Last clip. This is a practice clip from 101. So we're looking at the right guard here. He's the only guy active. This might be one of our best one-on-ones we've had in a long time so we're driving off our inside foot we're getting to our spot we're maintaining that integrity of the knee inside the toe we're using independent hands we get a little bit of flare that elbow initially and then we lock it right in from there he's using his left hand as a control hand his inside hand as a control hand we're having active feet you can see he's creating separation with his punch where he's getting his chin away from his wrist right so he's protecting his head he's getting his chin away from his wrist He's getting his feet out there so that he can maintain his base so his shoulders don't get over his heels and he doesn't get pulled over his toes. And then, so we get, I'm going to go through the whole thing. So we have stance, pre-contact, so he's got to play through me, contact, create space, defender tries to get off, finish. Right? Perfect rep. All four phases controls it the whole way, deals with the unpredictability, feels the pressures in his hands and his feet, and keeps his feet and his hands moving. Perfect rep the whole way, all four phases. Yeah. Stance, pre-contact, contact, finish. That's it. I think that was a super clean rep there. You see, especially even on the inside, guys, I think you know people talk about pass that all the time, and they're usually talking about tackles. Uh, as a former guard, getting out and protecting that B-gap is a tough job. Yeah. Um, so what's, what's your landmark... Um, in terms of when you talk about guys setting in that pre-contact phase, yeah, relative to the the defender, where are they setting to on the defender? Yeah, like I would I would say like I've used a couple different cues over time. Um, you know, you want to cover their inside three quarters of their body. Um, physical cue, verb or uh, visual cue are a couple different things too. So like physical cue, you would want to split uh, split their crotch with your outside knee. Um, that's putting you at that position of taking, you know, three quarters to a half or so. Um, depending on if you're a guard or an inside, you want to take more or less. Like as a guard, you probably want to take a little more uh, where you want to edge on that three quarter side more. Whereas a tackle, you're probably going to edge more to a half inside half so you can protect inside move a little more. Um, you also have less help out there usually. Um, so I'd say inside three quarters probably for an inside guy and then inside half for a tackle. Um, and then in terms of contact, you're always like, anytime you can get hands to the chest, middle of the chest is money. Um, ideally your outside hand to that middle of the chest area. And that way they're always running the outside loop on you. Do you have, uh, we talked a lot about a few things. Um, number one, keeping that foot inside the knee. Do you have any, you know, if you were to give people any advice on how do you work that? Is there a really basic way that you know, you try and break guys into that habit of while they're moving, keeping that uh, knee inside the big toe. Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely tough. Um, doing it in season is really difficult. Um, and it, correcting that in season is hard. Um, but the way I would suggest it is, if you have some uh, like heavier resistance bands, um, that's probably my probably my best advice uh, to work on it. We spent a lot of time in the off season using the resistance bands to work on those types of things. Um, and all you really have to do is wrap it around uh, the teardrop muscle, the VMO, the big bump of the quad just above the knee. Um, you're going to wrap it from there and pull resistance laterally, so outside the knee, and have the, the athlete engage that in by squeezing the band. And then you do whatever drill you're going to do. You can do a pass set drill. Uh, you can do something with a med ball. You could even do just a one-step set. Um, you know, it really depends on what, what you want to do with it. But as long as you're pulling that resistance and having the athlete have to keep it engaged, then you're starting to build those, that muscle memory. And then what you do is you start building the muscle memory of taking the band off. 
So you do a rep, whatever the rep of the drill you're doing with the band, and then you take the band off and do the drill again immediately to see if that muscle memory translates. And that way you can actually monitor to see if it's actually happening. Uh, but again, in season, it's a little difficult. Um, it's it's definitely much better as a practice out, out of season. But for young offensive athletes, I would say it's definitely worth doing in season, even if it's just providing them the resource like before practice, right? You spend one indie drill showing them how to do it as a coach and then leaving those resources available for them before practice and say that's, your, that's part of your pre-practice routine. You have to do this before you're allowed on the field um, so that they're taking that ownership over their own things that they can control awesome well we're going to try and have you on again and and talk a little bit more about uh how you're preparing laurie's offensive line athletes really appreciate having you on um and uh we'll have you back soon absolutely i'm looking forward to it all right thanks coach zach scotto wilford laurie's offensive line coach uh i'll be sure they run a a great instagram account i'll be sure to leave uh (laughs) that in the in the show notes here um so you guys can follow them Uh, on Instagram. Appreciate it, coach. Thanks.